Hello and welcome to another podcast episode. I'm Ray. Now then, no weather report this time because this is pre-recorded. Well, they're all pre-recorded. They're not live. But quite a few days before you're actually going to hear it. Holiday time has clashed with the coronation and uh, various other things. We're away for a week. Um, so it's it's all a bit of a, a mishmash this time. However, due to popular demand, one or two of you, all right, one of you said, how about the NHS? I've talked about the NHS before, haven't I? Now, actually, quite a few of you over the last few weeks, because of the nurses on strike and young doctors, or is it junior doctors on strike, several of you have said, uh, what's happening to the NHS in uh, in Britain? So many of the listeners are abroad so it is interesting, it seems, for them to find out firsthand as to what happens here about the NHS. I only have praise for the NHS, the doctors, the staff, the nurses, the consultants, all of them. It's not their fault that the NHS is having problems. It's always had problems. Anyway, we'll come on to that in a minute. Lovely to hear from you. I've had emails, but uh, I've already answered those. As I say, this is pre-recorded quite a few days before. So any emails since I've had emails, <laughs> if you see what I mean, any emails since my last lot of emails, I haven't read. Is that right? No, I haven't received them yet. I don't know what I'm talking about. How are you? Lovely to be back with you on this Sunday. I know a lot of you listen on Sunday, uh, that's when it's published. I know a lot of you listen then because I can see the, the statistics, you know, what happens and what goes on. And there's also a map of the world on the kind of dashboard page or whatever this pod bean thing does. So I can see where listeners are. Now there's Mrs. Jones, 53 High Street, uh, Nottingham. <laughs> no, it doesn't actually give names and addresses. That would be good, wouldn't it? Hello, Morse code again. Here we go. So something's going on there. Anyway, enough of that. Don't worry about Morse code. Raise rants at protonmail.com. Be lovely to hear from you. And I will answer your emails. I always do. It's just that there's a gap. There are no emails at this moment in time. That's another dreadful expression. Anyway, that's enough of me rambling for a minute. Let's move on. The NHS, the National Health Service, known the world over. A friend of mine calls it the IHS, International Health Service. I've heard that mentioned on the TV, you know, these chat programmes on the news channels. I've heard people there say, well, it's the International Health Service because people come from abroad, use it and then go home. I think they're supposed to pay, but they don't, it seems. Some of them don't pay. They come and get the, the medical treatment they want and then go back home. But what is the answer? There's all this people moaning about. I mean, it's been going on, hasn't it, for decades. The NHS is in crisis Billions and billions of pounds have been ploughed into it. And it's still, I mean, it works. My experience of the NHS has always been fantastic. No complaints whatsoever. But there are waiting lists, aren't they? People have to wait a year, two years for operations, things like that. It seems that no matter how much money is ploughed into it, it doesn't seem to help. There are still the waiting lists. You get headlines, don't you? Someone had to wait nine hours for an ambulance. Someone had to wait 15 hours for an ambulance or it never turned up and they died. And you think, well, what's going on there? So it's not just money, is it? It doesn't just want money thrown at it all the time. So I don't know what the answer is. Funnily enough, I was talking to my mother the other day about this and she was saying that her mother, my grandmother, when she wanted the doctor, now this is going back before the NHS, when she wanted the doctor... She'd have to go round, they didn't have a telephone, she'd have to go round to the house where the doctor lived and say, could you come and look at one of my children? And you had to pay, you had to pay the doctor. Now, my nan had seven children, my mum was one of seven. One after the other, they got measles and the doctor came round. They didn't have any money, you know, my grandmother didn't have any money. Her husband was a gardener, my grandfather. So what the doctor did with all the kids having measles, he kept calling for no payment, well, not cash anyway, but my grandfather gave him fruit and vegetables from the garden, have some cabbages, have some tomatoes, because my grandfather, he was a gardener, that's what he did for a living. So his own garden was obviously full of all this amazing fruit and vegetables. So he paid the doctor that way. That's incredible, isn't it? Because they didn't have any money. 
And of course, back then, if you didn't have any money, you couldn't get the doctor. Presumably, a lot of doctors said, look, I'll come and have a look at your child or your children. Don't worry about the payment because, you know, they're they're human beings, aren't they? They feel sorry for the children. It must have been a huge, immense relief when the NHS idea started, when that kicked off. You could take your kids to your doctor and didn't have to pay anything. That must have been amazing. My first experience of hospital, the NHS, was when I ruptured my liver. I was 14 years old, stood up on my bike. I had gears on the on the bike, stood up on the pedal, on the right-hand pedal, and the gears slipped. So my foot went right the way down on the pedal, very fast. The cow horn handlebars came round to the right, whacked me in the stomach, didn't pierce the skin at all, but really whacked me and ruptured my liver. I remember laying on the ground in dreadful pain. I managed to get up and I was clinging to a lamppost and my brother was with me. He wasn't sure, my younger brother, he wasn't sure what to do. And then I sort of fell off the lamppost and someone took me into their house. This lady and her son took me into her house. She said, a cup of sweet tea will fix you. Everyone had sweet tea in those days. Well, it doesn't matter what it was, you break your back. Oh, have a cup of sweet tea. Anyway, this kind lady made me some tea, which I didn't have because I kept passing out with the pain. In the end, her son put me in his car, took me home. And I remember rolling around on my bed, falling on the floor in and out of consciousness. And my sister and my mum, in the end, they, they said, look, we've got to get an ambulance, which they did. And I didn't have to wait nine hours. I don't know how long it took, but uh, only a few minutes. And whizzed me off to the hospital. And that was my first experience of going in, actually into hospital. It was amazing. Well, I I was, I got there at midday and it was 11 o'clock at night when they operated. So I was 11 hours in and out of consciousness and all this pain, it was awful. But they were fantastic. I was on a trolley outside the operating theatre. I remember that. And there was this student nurse. She was 17. I know that because she told me. I had heard someone say to her, don't let him go to sleep, keep talking to him. And I didn't know why, I didn't know what was going on. All I knew about was the pain. And she was telling me all about her boyfriend, bless her, this 17-year-old student nurse. And I was thinking, I don't want to know about your boyfriend, this hurts, I just want to go to sleep. And they did say to me afterwards, had I gone to sleep, that would have been it. Anyway, I was wheeled into the theatre in the end and dealt with. But it was fantastic. I was only in there for two weeks. That's pretty quick back then. In those days, you were in hospital having a baby for three weeks. Well, not having it for three weeks, but you're in there. These days, you're lucky to be there more than three hours if you have a baby. It's changed, hasn't it? But the people there, the nurses, everyone, they were absolutely fantastic. I remember the next day, I was in bed in the ward. I don't know whether I'd been asleep or what had happened, but I remember opening my eyes and looking round and thinking, oh, this is a hospital ward. I wasn't sure where I was. And one of the nurses saw that I was awake, and she came over. She was lovely. They were all lovely, absolutely brilliant people. I had 14 stitches, and uh, the time came to remove them. This must have been a week or whatever later. And this student nurse, another one, was sent to remove the stitches, and she was having a job. They looked like boot laces. You know, they were thick I don't know, thick, dark brown, uh, sushas, are they sushas? I don't know. And she's trying to pull these stitches out. And I'm "Ah, ah, ah, ah," I'm doing all this. And the matron, like Hattie Jakes, the matron, you remember the Carry On films, Carry On Doctor and all that. She came over. What's the matter, nurse? What are you doing? And this nurse said, oh, I'm having a bit of trouble. I'll show you how to get the stitches out. There was this last one that was stuck. And the, the matron, well, she basically ripped it out like that there's blood all trickling down my stomach and I'm, I'm making painful type noises and complaining and uh, the nurse is laughing and she got told off for laughing oh it was just funny well it hurt a lot but it was funny this matron woman I think that's what they need today they need some matron type people back on the wards sort things out I don't know do they have matrons anymore I don't know and then of course as it neared time for me to leave hospital I was put out on the balcony because I was in men's surgical they were in two minds they were saying to me whether to put me in the children's ward or men's surgical because I was 14 
Anyway, they went and put me in men's surgery. And t I'll tell you what, in the night, I'm awake in my bed looking round. There's a nurse at her desk with her little desk lamp doing whatever she's doing. And then suddenly the screens are pulled round the bed and a trolley comes in and someone's wheeled out. And I didn't know what was going on. This happened almost every night. And one morning I said to one of the nurses, I said, well, what's this people wheeled out in the night? Oh, don't worry about that. And I said, no, but it happens all the time. And she said, well, they passed away. And I'm thinking, good grief. There's people dying all around me. They're all dying. Luckily, I wasn't. They did say to my parents after the operation, apparently they phoned, the surgeon phoned my parents. And he said the operation was successful, but do bear in mind it's still, uh, his words, 50-50. So, of course, that uh, worried my parents, obviously. Didn't worry me. I knew nothing about it. But as I neared the time to come out, I went out on the balcony. There were four or six beds, I think, out there. And that's where the people go that are about to leave. And it was lovely. It was like a conservatory. The sun shining in. It was summer. Sun shining in. Really nice. And a couple of the nurses came out. with. They each had a pair of scissors. Stood either side of my bed. And I'm thinking, what are the scissors for? And I said, what are you doing? I had long hair. Bear in mind, this is the 1960s. And they said, we've come to cut your hair. And I said, no, 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 I don't want my hair cut. And they're going, snip, snip, snip. They didn't do it, but uh, they were laughing and giggling. It was good. As I say, it was all lovely, absolutely fantastic. I was going to say a fantastic experience. Uh, rupturing your liver really isn't a good experience. It, I think I've told you before. There was a fantastic bonus, a real result from rupturing my liver. By the time I'd convalesced and all that, too late to go back to school. Yes, what a result. I couldn't believe my luck. So I went and got a job as a radio and TV apprentice engineer at the age of 15. Fantastic. So that was my first ever experience, proper experience of the NHS. I mean, obviously I'd been to the doctor before. The doctors were funny then, your local GP. Uh, our one, Dr. Askey, his name, I remember him. He was like a headmaster. Do you remember Wacko, Jimmy Edwards, the uh, the programme, the schoolboy programme, Wacko with Jimmy Edwards? That was brilliant. This Dr. Askey was like him with the moustache and everything. And he'd sit at his desk, smoking. I remember my mum going in there with me, tap, you know, she tapped on the door, duh, duh, and you'd hear this chap, come. And you go in there and he didn't even look up from his desk. We went up and stood, didn't sit, stood before his desk like the headmaster. And he just said, yes. And then my mum said whatever it was, always oh, got a sore throat or whatever. And the chap was smoking, flicking his ash in the ashtray. And eventually he looked up, oh yeah, disprin, 24 hours in bed. Everyone had disprin. It was dissolvable aspirin, I think. So that was it. Whatever was wrong with you. Disprint and 24 hours in bed. Well, that was good. Another day off school. I like that. But they were funny, though, the doctors then. I mean, they were good. They weren't dismissive or anything. He seemed uh, dismissive. That's how he came across. But he was a good doctor. They were all good doctors. I had a diphtheria injection in my rear. I remember that. I felt ill. This doctor came round. They don't come to the house anymore. But this doctor came round. And he said, well, I don't know. I'll give him a diphtheria injection. And I'm thinking, what's diphtheria? Well, I've since learned that it's some lethal disease. Anyway, it stuck a needle in my rear and that was that. So I don't know whether I had diphtheria or not. But that was good. When we had a phone, eventually we had a telephone. You just phoned the surgery. Oh, well, you know, one of my children's not well. And the doctor would come round perhaps that afternoon. Certainly the same day, he'd come round in his posh car. They all had posh cars. A lot of them had sports cars. MGB, stuff like that. Their little sports cars, they like that. Because they had money, didn't they, doctors? So, yes, it was uh, all my experience of the NHS was good. I went to St Thomas's Hospital. How old was I then? About 30, oh dear, I don't know, 35? I don't know, let's say I was 35. And I had a, a parathyroid removed. There are four. You've got your thyroids or whatever. And these parathyroids, there are four. And I had one removed. It was overactive. And that was strange. I had too much calcium in my blood or whatever. Anyway, up at St Thomas's, brilliant. Lovely people again, lovely nurses. Well, nurses are always lovely, aren't they? Fantastic time. I was only, what was I there, a week? I think I was there about a week. I can't remember. 
perfect experience, you know, from beginning to end. When I first went up there, saw a doctor, a consultant, talked about it, he explained everything. Then I went up there to have the operation. And I don't know, there's the aftercare at my local GP. I had to go there and have tests and things. Overactive thyroid, parathyroid is weird. I was getting tired about two o'clock every afternoon. I just go to sleep, no matter where I was, in an armchair or at work, wherever, I just go to sleep. It was weird for about an hour. And my doctor, I went to him and I told him that. And he said, parathyroid. And he hadn't even looked at me. And he did a couple of tests, blood tests, and then got back to me, of course. Yep, that's it. Overactive parathyroid. Anyway, brilliant. Absolutely fantastic. I was going to say experience again, but no, you don't want to... They cut my neck open. What they do, they cut round the front of your neck and tip your head back. No, they don't really. I'm joking. I bet some of you believe that. No, I did have a big... Well, I have. I've got a scar in one of the creases round my neck. Instead of stitches, I had metal clips. I remember looking in the mirror. I went into the loo and I looked in the mirror and I thought, what on earth is that as a row of sort of gold colour metal clips all around my neck? Of course, the NHS, you used to be able to have your glasses, if you wear glasses, done, hearing aids. Dentists, most of them were NHS. There are none now, or hardly any. Everything is private. But no one ever thought about paying. You know, you just go along to the doctor, the dentist, the hospital, the optician. It's just all on the NHS. But of course, it's changing. I don't know what has gone wrong. Some people are saying, well, now there are more people. The population has doubled, trebled, quadrupled or whatever. So the NHS can't cope. Other people are saying we've got, what's that expression? Too many chiefs and not enough Indians. In other words, a load of management and bosses and hardly any sort of workers on the ground, doctors and nurses. Each political party, when they're in opposition, they say, we're going to sort out the NHS. We will do this. We will do that. We will slash waiting times, blah, blah, blah. When and if they get into power, same old thing. Nothing ever happens. We've just had our local council elections. Some people vote Conservative, some people vote Labour, some people vote Other. It's all a waste of time. No one does anything properly. The turnout, I heard, I'm I'm not going to get into politics, but apparently the average turnout was 25%. Now, what does that tell you? It tells you that people have lost interest. Not that they probably ever had any interest, but 25% average turnout. It's because it's that expression that keeps coming up. Same old, same old. You get Labour in, same old, same old. Conservatives get it, yeah, same old. We're going to do this, we're going to do that. We'll sort out the potholes in the roads. We'll sort out the NHS, blah, blah, blah. Nothing ever happens. So I think now people aren't even bothering to vote. But the NHS, I don't know, it is sad. It would be sad if we lost it. I think what it needs is some decent person, I was going to say chap, that's sexist, isn't it? I'm not allowed to say that. A person... A human, (laughs) a decent human at the top to say, right, this is what we're going to do. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. If you don't like it, you're sacked. (laughs) Someone with a bit of go in them, a bit of get up and go, a bit of authority. I've just opened the post. Guess what's turned up? Copper fuel pipe for my Lister D stationary engine. Lovely. I shall fit that later. That's exciting, isn't it? I thought that would make your day. Now the excitement is over. Back to the NHS. Trisha's sister, when she was three years old, back in the 60s, she had measles. The doctor came out, saw her on the Saturday, and he was quite worried about her. And on Sunday morning, this is amazing, Sunday morning, six o'clock, the doorbell rang. Trisha's mum and dad went down to see who it was at that hour. It was the doctor. He said, I'm worried. I've come to see her. Is she all right? He was worried. He'd obviously been thinking about her in the night. He'd probably been awake all night, worrying about her. Six o'clock Sunday morning, he went round to check up on her. Isn't that amazing? You're lucky to see a doctor at the surgery these days, let alone visit your house, let alone visit your house at six o'clock on a Sunday morning. So look how things have changed. I was saying earlier about the population increase, you know, since the old days, the doctors can't do house calls anymore. There'd be too many. They'd be all day out in their car going round the houses. The trouble is, 
There are too many people, I've always said this, haven't I, about cars. There's too many cars on the roads. This is why there's gridlocks everywhere, traffic jams and problems. There's too many cars. But what can you do? Too many people. I mean, the UK is a small island, as you know. We can only fit so many in if we keep expanding the population. If we keep breeding, (laughs) then I don't know what's going to happen in the end. If everyone has cars, all the kids that are coming up to 17 years old, right, I can drive now. I want a car. Well, I don't know. I don't know what will happen in the end. The NHS can't cope. The roads can't cope. Nothing can cope. What will happen? That's an interesting point, isn't it? Everything might grind to a halt. Just looking out of the window, it's pouring with rain, absolutely lashing with rain. Mind you, the lawn needs it, the plants need it, so that's good. My sister-in-law, she's retired now, but she was a nurse. And she said that sometimes they didn't get a break. You know, they're busy. She worked on A&E, accident and emergency. Didn't get a break. You've got an emergency on, you've got people coming in, in ambulances. Didn't even get time for a drink, let alone something to eat. And she she worked all night on A&E, finished at three in the morning, I think. And she did that for, was it 15 years? I can't remember what she said. And this is going back a few years, because as I say, she's retired now. And she used to get home completely shattered after her shift. I know all the nurses have been on strike and everything recently. And I don't think it's just for the money, isn't it? It's working conditions. They just can't do it. They're exhausted. But again, what's the answer there? Do you give them more money and say, well, there you are, you're knackered, but at least you've got some money. That's not going to help really, is it? I don't know what the answer is. I keep saying that, and I think this is what the politicians keep thinking. I don't know what the answer is. The NHS is like a a massive company, isn't it? Imagine, it must be the biggest company in, in the UK. Imagine if it was a private company. How on earth do you run something that big with so many branches, dentists, doctors, GPs, hospitals, all these places everywhere throughout the country? How on earth do you run it? Who's in charge of it? Oh, it's probably some politician, isn't it? Some minister of health or whatever. I don't know who they are. They change with the wind. But imagine being in charge of something like that. Where do you start? Where on earth would you start? I don't know. In the past, you have a big company like Marks and Spencers and they're having trouble. So they bring in a top man, don't they? They headhunt a top man. He knows nothing about the business at all, about the the retail side of it, what they sell or anything. But he's put in at the top to sort things out. And sometimes it works. So who could we put in charge of the NHS? What's always amazed me is you'll get a minister, for example, so-and-so has just been made minister of education and he knows nothing about education or minister of health. He knows nothing about health. Surely the minister of health would be doctor someone, someone that's actually worked in the hospital as a doctor, as a consultant. That would be an ideal person for the minister of health, not someone that last week was the minister of transport and is now minister of health. I've never understood that. How, what do they know? They don't know anything. Something else I don't understand. Who would want to be prime minister or president? Like you've got Biden in America. We've got uh, Sunak here. Who would want that job? It must be awful. Whatever you do is wrong. It must be stressful. It must, well, it's a 24 hour a day job, isn't it? People moaning at you. The slightest thing you do, it's in the newspaper. It's on the TV. Oh, he's done this. He's done that. It must be awful. Who would want a job like that? It must be an idiot to want a job like that, I would have thought. King Charles. I wonder whether he wants to be King Charles. He's waited a long time, hasn't he? Do you think he's got, in his own mind, he's thinking, I really don't want to do this. I'd rather go and sit in the pub and have a beer with some mates. I've often wondered that about the royal family. Do they? I suppose they've been brought up in, it, it is their life, isn't it? I've often thought if I were a member of the royal family, I wouldn't be able to pop down the local shop. I wouldn't be able to pop into a pub, have a couple of beers and a chat with the lads. You can't do anything like that, can you? It must be, I mean, again, a 24 hour a day job. Just stick your head out the window and you've got a hundred photographs taken of you or more. It must be awful. I don't know. I wonder whether he thinks or, or says to people in the palace, I wonder whether he says, oh, here we go. 
That's it. I'm going to be king today. Oh, dear me. That's the last thing I need. I don't know. Love to be a fly on the wall. That's a good expression, isn't it? I wonder what he really thinks. Of course, we'll never know, will we? Perhaps he loves it. I heard Mick Jagger once talking on the radio and he was saying that he puts on a disguise. If he wants to pop out somewhere locally, he'll put on a disguise. I suppose a beard and sunglasses and a hat. And then he can wander off down the street and not have people say, Oh, Mick, how are you doing? Oh, I love your records, taking photographs. It really must be, I don't know, it must be, I suppose they get used to it, but it must be awful. There must be times when celebrities think, Right, I just want to pop down the shop. Here we go. This is going to be a nightmare. As soon as they start walking down the street, photographs, people shout, Oh, hello, hello, how are you doing? I've no idea what that's got to do with the NHS, but not to worry. My surgeon that did my liver, Mr Martin, they're not called doctors, right? they don't have a title, do they? Mr. Mr Martin. He was a, a lovely man. He spoke to me after, he said to me after the operation, just before I went home, he was saying, well, good luck and everything, blah, blah, blah. And he said, oh, by the way, never drink too much. Don't ever drink too much because, you know, this is your liver, blah, blah, blah. So what did I do? As soon as I was old enough, went in the pub and didn't come out for the rest of my life. Well, no, I did. I went home, obviously. But I did. I drank too much. The thing is, with your liver, I have read, and this is true, every seven years, it's a new liver. So it was it regenerate or whatever it does? Isn't it a shame that teeth aren't like fingernails? They grow and grow and grow. They keep growing. So if you break a tooth or you lose a tooth, another one comes out and it keeps growing. And if you chip a bit off it or it starts going funny, that's all right. It keeps growing and you've got a new tooth. I think rabbits are like that, aren't they? Don't their teeth keep growing? Now, that would be brilliant. Actually, that would be good. That would put the dentists out of business. No, it wouldn't because they'd have to file your teeth down, wouldn't they? and clean them and stuff. They still make their money somehow. I've got a gap. My dentist said, I can fill that. I can put a tooth in that gap into your gum. And I said, well, that would be good. £3,000, he said. Oh, you're joking. 3000 What? I could buy a lovely new amateur radio transmitter for that, a nice bit of kit. £3,000 for a plastic tooth. Well, it's not plastic, is it? Porcelain. Yeah, I'd rather spend that money on some amateur radio gear or some new aerials and stuff like that, as if I haven't got enough already outside in the garden and all over the house. I did say to him, I thought I'd do the, the sorry, you know, the sob story. I said, oh, I'd really like that. Yeah, I've wanted that gap filled for ages, but I really can't afford that. Hoping he'd say, well, I'll tell you what, I'll do. You know, no, I'm losing money, but he didn't. That was the end of that subject. You haven't got three grand. You don't get a plastic tooth. Sorry porcelain tooth end of he was a nice chap he's moved on now but he was a nice chap i liked him really nice chap i think he was portuguese we've now got a new dentist we keep getting different dentists every time we go we get different dentist we've now got a new one so our checkup is sometime later this year we're going to meet him he'll probably say i can put a porcelain tooth in that gap oh really how much five grand <laughs> it's gone up well the price of porcelain does go up doesn't it regularly I've checked it on the stock exchange. No, I haven't. Talking, what's that word beginning with B? What are we going to do now? What should I talk about now? We've got about the, the NHS. We've got all about that. I must admit, looking back, here we go. When I was a boy, looking back though to the 50s and 60s, okay, the medical profession, they didn't have all the gear they've got now, all the ultra scan stuff and MRI scanners and all these CC something else scanners. They got some fantastic equipment now. They didn't have any of that. They had a basic, what, X-ray machine? And I think that was about it. Dreadful looking instruments. And that was it. But they were dedicated, as they are now, they were dedicated and they did a fantastic job even back then. It's just a shame that the whole arrangement, the whole setup seems to be, well, perpetually in such a mess. You've probably heard various ideas and various theories where are all the doctors well they go abroad to work because you can earn three four five times the money say in america or wherever than you can in britain a fully qualified doctor or a surgeon three four or five times the money so it's tempting isn't it you're going to think well i don't know that's a lot of money it's a new life california where the sun always shines. Yeah, it, it's tempting, isn't it? And of course, people do 
clear off abroad. Same with nurses. They could earn a lot more by leaving the UK and going abroad somewhere to private hospitals. I did say to my sister-in-law, as the one that was a nurse, I said to her once, do nurses working for private hospitals, private places, do they get a lot more in the way of salary? And she said, yeah, they do. They do get quite a lot more. Better working conditions and quite a lot more money. So you might think, well, why not pay our nurses, doctors, surgeons, consultants, treble or quadruple their salaries? I suppose because the money isn't there, is it? Because the NHS isn't a private setup, they just don't have the money. I just wonder what the future holds, as no doubt everyone does. Well, you've probably had enough about the NHS now. To be honest, it's the, the subject that you can talk about day in, day out, forever. Well, it's still pouring with rain. It's absolutely lashing down now. I don't know what's going on. Now, this is holiday time. I'm recording this Sunday episode way before Sunday. (laughs) I won't tell you when, but it is way, way, way before Sunday. That's why I've not mentioned emails, because I haven't had any. Well, I have, but I've spoken about them. I'm trying to catch up. I'm trying to get really up ahead of everything. What I am looking forward to is doing a little bit of outside broadcast type recording uh, when I'm on holiday on the Isle of Wight. I'm not quite sure what the weather's going to be like on the island, but uh, hopefully it won't be raining like it is now. I've still got this a bit of a funny throat. I don't know whether I'm getting a cold. That's marvellous, isn't it? That's all I need. A cold, just as we're on holiday. But that's life, isn't it? That is life. (laughs) Happy days. Raise rants at protonmail.com if you want to email me and have a moan or a rant about something raise rants at protonmail.com how many of you watch the coronation king charles the third how many of you watch that no doubt it's all around the world isn't it on your tvs all around the world i'm recording this before the coronation so i can't really say much about it i don't know what's happened but i'm sure Wherever you are, as I say, around the world, you'll be watching it on your TV screens. Fantastic. I wonder how many millions of viewers there are. I wonder what the weather will do. That's an important thing. They don't want rain, do they? On the one hand, they don't want lashing rain. On the other hand, they don't want red-hot sunshine. So people are, are dehydrated and fainting. Something in the middle. That's what we need. We're heading well into May now. And apart from... Two or three days of lovely warm sunshine. It's been cold and wet and horrible. How are you doing down in Australia? There's Rob down there, several of you down there. How are you doing down there? Is it your midwinter, isn't it? Yeah, ah, you see, payback time. I remember in our winter saying, oh, you've got the summer down there. It's all right for you. It's freezing here. Now it's our summer. Well, you wouldn't think so. If you were here, if any of you Australian people were here and you look at our weather, you'd say, well, it's winter. Yeah, it's not. This is our summer. Is it officially summertime? I don't know. I never know what's what. I get totally confused with the seasons. I'm always saying to Trish, is it winter yet? Is it summer yet? Is it spring? When does autumn start? I haven't got a clue. I think they keep changing it. The best thing to do is look out of the window. Right, which season are we in? I would say at a guess now, autumn. Autumnal, there's a word, autumnal. Wintry. Because we've got rain. It's not cold. It's about 15 degrees out there, so it's not cold. Anyway, down in Australia, how are you enjoying your winter? Hang on, another news alert now, what's happened? Oh, more stuff about the... What are they on about the weather? Yes, so what are you doing down in Sydney and uh, Canberra and the rest of it? Have you got snow, six foot of snow? (laughs) I bet you, I bet the sun's out. I bet your weather is better than ours, isn't it? You've got the sun, sunshine. I bet you're down the beach having a swim. That's what Australians do, even in the winter, isn't it? Just as well I don't live there because I can't swim. I've never been tempted to live abroad. There was a time once when I was a lot younger, I used to think it must be nice to live somewhere where the sun always shines and where it's warm. Because holidays down in uh, Cyprus, Greece, down south of uh, France, you know, the Mediterranean places, Portugal's nice, down the south of Spain. On holidays, I'd look at the, the houses and people would have for example, a washing machine and a freezer outside on the patio. They'd have it outside instead of cluttering up the house. And I used to think that must be nice. It doesn't rust there because it's not 
continually damp and perpetually raining. I remember seeing a lot of that washing machine, freezer, all sorts of things out on the patio, under a sort of patio roof, like I've built out the back of our house. So it's not in the immediate rain, but it's not damp all the time like it is here. So they don't rust. I remember thinking every time I went abroad, wherever it was, Greece, Spain, Portugal, anywhere, they use their patios as sort of part of the, well, part of the house, part of the kitchen, domestic appliances and things outside. And I must admit, there were times when I'd think, it must be nice to live here permanently. But of course, then I'd be saying, oh, it's too hot all the time and I'd miss the seasons, wouldn't I? The grass is always greener, as they say. I've just sneezed. I hope I'm not going to get a cold. That's all I need. Yes, the grass is always greener on the other side of the fence, isn't it? Until you get there, then you think, what am I doing here? I know people that have been to live abroad. In fact, my parents, many years ago, they went to live in Spain. Javier, is it called Javier with a J? They were out there for, what, three or four years? We visited them. It was difficult for them because they were getting old. I was going to say a long time ago. It wasn't that long ago. They were getting old. And they didn't have gas laid on. You had to go and get colour gas cylinders. And they were big, huge cylinders. So, you know, my dad had to lug those back, get them in the back of the car and stuff. It was very difficult. And I don't think the weather was quite what they expected because in the winter, they were cold. No central heating, of course. They had an open fire. I don't know what they burnt on that. Wood, I suppose. But they had no real heating. They thought that it was going to be sort of, I don't know, red hot all year round. And it wasn't. So in the summer, there were times when they were too hot. And in the winter, there were times when they were very cold. They lasted three or four years and they came back to back to England. Good old blighty. My mother was looking forward to growing vegetables out there because, oh, you know, the sun's out. It's going to be lovely weather. And she grew runner beans. In fact, I've just planted our runner bean seeds. And they they came up, they germinated and stuff, and they started growing, and they all died. Too hot. Blazing sun on the runner beans. She watered them all the time, every five minutes, a few gallons of water, and they died. They couldn't stand the heat. They should have been in the shade somewhere. Of course, she didn't think of that. So, yes, it's, uh, it's not always greener, is it, the grass? I shall end this episode in a minute. I will no doubt be telling you all about the Isle of Wight when we get back home tell you all about that and there will be recordings as I've promised as I've threatened so you must listen to that me in the woods saying listen can you hear that bird song and you'll be thinking oh here we go again do we have to yes you do (laughs) it's all part of the podcast I like it I like doing the outside broadcast the thing is it's it's weird I've done videos in the past for my website here I am on the Isle of Wight looking at aerials and stuff like that But when it's just a microphone and just audio, it's very odd. It's very, very different because try to describe things. And I have often thought, wouldn't I be better off just videoing this than I can shut up and say, look, this is what I'm talking about. But people do like podcasts. They do like them. I've been doing this now, is it three or four years? And over that period of time, I'm hearing and reading more and more that podcasts really are catching on because you can drive along in your car and listen. I know several people have contacted me. Chap in California, who was it in California? Going back about a year now. He said, I listen to your podcast in the car every morning when I'm driving to work. I'll listen to one of your podcast episodes. And I thought, yes, that's good. You couldn't do that with video. You could, well, you shouldn't really be watching a video when you're driving, should you? Not really. So yes, you, you, you can get on with other things, can't you? Get on with what you're doing. Uh, at the same time as listening to my droning on and banging on about this and that, about all this rubbish. Several people have said that they listen with, uh, they're not headphones, here we go again, we've had this recently. What are they called nowadays? Not earphones or headphones, pod things, pod phones. I don't know, there's things you stuff in your ears to listen to music. Who was it in Norway? Was there a chap in Norway? Goes for a walk in the woods, in the forest. And listens to me. I tell you what, if I was walking in the forest in Norway, I'd rather listen to the wildlife, the animals, than listen to me droning on. But people do like to go for a walk and have their music playing or listen to me or whatever. I don't. Whenever Trisha goes out for a walk, puts her music on, 
She can't hear anything else apart from music. I like, especially in the woods, I like to hear the, the sounds, the animals, the birds singing. And you will have to endure that, as I say, when I get back from the island, because I'm going to record the bird song. So, right, moving on. Oh, don't worry, it'll only be a few minutes. I do like that. I love waking up in the summer, four o'clock, half four in the morning, windows open, it's nice and warm, the sun's coming up, and the birds are singing. It just makes everything feel and seem so much better, doesn't it? When the sun shines, it's lovely. I've just had an email from Ellie in California. That's nice. Hello, Ellie. Just received your email this second. I will be answering it in a minute. Ellie says, when are you come into California, be nice to meet up for a drink and a chat. Uh, when am I going to California? I don't know, I might pop there tomorrow, pop out there tomorrow perhaps. It's a long way, Ellie. I've done it. I've been to California. I've said before, haven't I, about the, the helicopter trips and uh, we went on. It's a long way, Ellie. When do you come into England? Be nice to have a drink and a catch up, a little chat. I wonder whether you've ever been to England, Ellie. Anyway, lovely to hear from you. Glad you enjoy the podcast episodes. It's always nice to hear from people, obviously in the UK, but also around the world. Recently, we've had, well, as always, Australia. Several people in Australia email and message regularly. America, of course, Canada. And also a few dotted around the world in other places. Strange places. No, I mean, I don't mean your home is strange, wherever you live. Unheard, no, not unheard of places. My geography is not very good. Barbara in Michigan lives on an island. And when I first saw that, I thought, an island in Michigan? Well, that's in the middle of the land, isn't it? How can there be an island? So I looked it up on the map. And she's right. You're right, Barbara. You live on an island. I didn't know that. I bet you didn't know that. So that's interesting, isn't it? Geography. I've always enjoyed geography. I like geography questions on these sort of quiz shows that they have. But I'm not very good at it. I do know that the capital of Australia is Canberra or Canberra however you wish to pronounce that, because everyone says it's Sydney. And a lot of people seem to think the capital of Israel is, is it Haifa? And it's not, is it? It's Tel Aviv. And in fact, the other day, one of the quiz show questions, why am I talking about quiz shows? Capital of Madagascar. Do you know that? I didn't. I've never heard of it. Anyway, we don't want to talk about quiz shows. I'm not uh, speaking too clearly. I'm getting a cold, definitely. And I've noticed I'm not pronouncing my T's properly and speaking properly. I'm mumbling a little bit. It's because I'm getting blocked up. Don't you just hate cold? What is the point? It's like flies, isn't it? Blow flies everywhere. What is the point of flies and maggots? What do they do? That's one thing they've never been able to cure, the common cold. All this rubbish about cough mixture for a chesty cough and a light cough and a heavy cough and all this. It's all rubbish. They said on the telly, so it must be true. You're better off having honey and a lemon, making a honey and lemon drink, than spending 10 quid a bottle on this nonsense cough mixture. How can it be for different types of cough anyway? Honestly, some of these companies, they do talk rubbish. I could be a YouTube influencer, couldn't I? Have you heard of these influencer type people? What they do, they get paid millions by big companies for saying, oh, I love Heinz baked beans. Well, gee, I don't. So I'm not going to get paid much by the cough mixture companies now, am I? In fact, I'll probably get sued for calling their products rubbish. Well, they are rubbish. They're overpriced as well. Everything is overpriced. Oh, hang on. What? That's, a, that's not news. That's WhatsApp. Someone's put here. Oh, it's Tricia. She's put why? Question mark. She's <laughs> obviously answering someone else. Why? I don't want to be an influence. I'm a bad influence on certain people. I know that. Perhaps I could get paid for that, being a bad influencer. But some of these young girls, you know, they go on about makeup. I've seen the YouTube videos. They go on about makeup by various companies and they get paid a fortune trying different makeup, saying, oh, look, this one's lovely. I always use this one. No, they don't. They're lying. Well, I could do that, couldn't I? I could say Heinz beans are absolutely wonderful. Beans means Heinz. That's what the advert says. And they're right. They're lovely. Except I prefer Branston. Oh, that's it. That's another million quid I've lost. I've blown it now. Some of these adverts you see where someone's trying a cake or whatever it might be. And they're saying, oh, this is wonderful. Bliss. Delicious. And you imagine after the advert, they're spitting it out. Oh, I wouldn't buy that filth. <laughs> 
Uh, do I like all that? I like that. Have you seen some of these outtake programmes, you know, where they're the outtakes of the film where people are laughing or swearing or whatever? Perhaps I should do some outtakes because I do have some outtakes. I do have to edit the audio. Same with my videos that I make. I do have to edit them because sometimes I swear. I'm perhaps halfway through a recording, a clip or a video clip, and the dustmen are banging around outside and I'll say, oh, crikey. Or cripes. That's a good one, isn't it? Cripes. I wonder what that means. My phone used to do that. Well, it does in the winter. It says cripes, frost alert, because, you know, you get these alerts if it's too hot or too cold. And it comes up and says cripes. So you might hear me say that. That's why I have to edit the thing out. You don't hear me saying blimey. Do you know where blimey comes from? This is interesting. People say, cool, blimey. What it means is God blind me. It's not a very nice thing to say, actually, God blimey. That's where it comes from. So I don't say blimey anymore, I say crikey instead. I don't know what crikey means, but it's a, it's an, ex, an explanation, isn't it? I've just looked up cripes, and it's a, a euphemism for Christ. So that's interesting. I looked up uh, God blimey, and I was right on that one. And I looked up crikey. I think that's some ancient religious thing as well. Amazing, I've always been interested in the etymology of words, where they came from when they were first used. Quite interesting, actually. Now, had they talked about that sort of thing at school, I would have you know, sat up and taken notice. But no, 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 they ramble on about something happened in 1066 or something, which is far less interesting in my view anyway. Funnily enough, I was talking to my sister the other day, and we were talking about history and things, and we were agreeing that back at school... We didn't take much notice, history, geography. But now, as she was saying, she's interested. It's a shame. What they should do is have school at the end of your life. No, that wouldn't work, would it? But have school when you're older. No, that wouldn't work either. Anyway, there it wouldn't matter when I went to school. I wouldn't have learned anything, whatever age I was. I went to the University of Life. Now, that was interesting. That was fun. Back in my teenage years, the University of Life... I think the less said about that, the better. Stone the crows. I threatened to end the episode a little while ago, didn't I? I will end it now. I think we've had enough. We've done the NHS, haven't we? Talked about the University of Life. Well, not really. A bit about history. A bit about the winter out in Australia where they're sunning themselves on the beach. What a lovely thought, sunning yourself on the beach in midwinter. So that's it. Raise rants at protonmail.com if you wish to say anything or have a shout out. Yeah, that's good. Have a shout out or send me an MP3. That would be good. Then I can put that on the episode for everyone to hear. As I've said before, even if you just say, oh, I'm Jack from Nottingham or I'm Fred from France or whatever. Anyway, take care, you lot. I should be back. Where are we? Uh, Wednesday with another midweek message. Until then, look after yourselves. Bye bye for now.